Welcome everyone to episode 24 of What's That Sound podcast. My name's Stu Watts and today I talked with Simon Morrow, who is a producer and engineer out of Melbourne, Australia. We talked about how important it is to have very high quality performers on your recordings uh, to allow for the best results how important it is to keep leveling up your business so that you can keep improving over time and impress your clients, as well as having a consistent workflow in the recording and mixing process so that you don't have to worry about unnecessary things when you're working. Please stay up to date by hitting follow or subscribe on your platform of choice and make sure you share this podcast on your socials uh, the ways, best ways you can do that is, you know, sharing it on a story, otherwise in a conversation, whether that's in a DM or a personal conversation, let's spread the word about this podcast. We want this to get out there to as many people as possible. With all that said and done, let's enjoy episode 24 with Simon Morrow. You're listening to What's That Sound with your host, Stu Watts. Welcome everyone to another episode of What's That Sound. My name is Stu Watts and today I'm here with Simon Morrow. Simon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Stu. This will be fun. This will be fun. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Um, we've had this book for a couple of weeks now, so keen to get into it, man. Let's um, let's kick off with a little bit of an about you, what you do in the music industry and uh, you know what you do in life. Cool. Well, I keep looking down to my notes because I'm at that age and that level of fatigue that I'm like, I probably just need to, you know, make notes of things. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, what I would do, I guess I'm a, I'm primarily a music producer and mixer with a technical specialty in mixing. And as a producer, I like pulling together teams. So I do a lot of work with solo artists that might need uh, further development and session players, orchestras, etc. So, um, probably one of the things one of the things interesting about the industry these days is that the terms don't always mean the same thing. And I think there's been a divergence between maybe a traditional producer, of which I believe you and I kind of fit into that category, where we are employed to produce artists, do the recording, oversee the project, mm -hmm. and then there are the the modern producers that maybe only do their own stuff. And, and I would say that's sort of more like a, an artist with very good technical abilities. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. So I don't do composition for hire, but if we need a composer, I'll bring one into the team. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm music, music producer and mixer. Um, yeah, that's, that's very what cool. I do. Um, yeah. 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 Tell us about, um, you know, where music came into play for you. Like what, what first sparked it, sparked it off for you? Okay. So there was a very clear moment in my life when I knew that I wanted to play music. Yep. Um, but earlier than that, well, I was, I was born at a young age and my dad was into music. <laughs> my dad was into music. And I think the first, the first cassette I ever owned was the Blues Brothers soundtrack. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. So I remember, you know, listening to, you know, that, that old school, old school, um, R and B mm -hmm. and you know, Hendrix and artists like that. And, yep. and it's funny looking back on video hits and rage in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even back then, I remember dad saying, oh, music's not what it used to be. <laughs> yeah. I feel like that, you know, that's just been rolling on, rolling on, rolling on. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I was always into music um as from a listening perspective mm -hmm. but when i was young i wanted to be a doctor <laughs> right and i don't know where that came from and i was also into um like outdoorsy stuff um you know camping and survival things and i remember a show what was it um like the bush tucker man or something yeah right yeah so i was that was the, you know i grew up down in the peninsula mornington peninsula cool. um yeah. then when my mum remarried we moved up to the city uh, in Melbourne. And my stepdad, um, he worked for the Vic Rock Foundation and organized music trade shows. And one of these things was the Melbourne International Guitar Show. 
which has actually come back and is on this coming weekend. No way. So awesome. I'm pretty sure the first one I went to was at Paran Town Hall, either in the late 80s or the, the early 90s. And I remember seeing this red Stratocaster in a you know glass display cabinet. <laughs> literally was, like Wayne's know, World. <laughs> it was literally like Wayne's World. <laughs> That's awesome. I like to play. Yeah. Um, and I just saw this and I thought, I need to know, I need to know how to do this thing. <laughs> I need to know how to use this and and then stomp boxes and this technology. So it was actually that trade show that got me interested in playing music. Cool. And I guess I, I probably would have been 10. So maybe it was 91 or something. Yep. And um and then I started a band in, in grade six at primary mm-hmm. school and we were just doing covers and um my uncle gave me an old uh Hofner um Hofner Galaxy, which is kind of like awesome. a Stratocaster. Okay, right. Um, yeah. And yeah, then I, I just wanted to play music. And then I got into gymnastics in high school and then computer programming at 15. Wow. And I, I wanted to be a software engineer, but I used to get headaches from the old yeah, right, CRT yeah. monitors. So, you know, so I thought, well, I can't, I can't do a job where I'm, you know, getting migraines all the time. True, yeah. And then I fell back in love with with music and just, yeah, got some of the guys from the primary school band back together. We went to separate high schools. Yep. Started playing music again, started playing bands and, um, yeah, did music performance in in school and got to the end of high school in 99 wanting to study something to do with music. I wanted to be a performer. I didn't even know there was a career in the industry that I work. I didn't know it existed. I had a tape four track that was my stepdad's yeah, and an yeah, old cool. like a boss 707 drum machine you know the seven yep. that is the the drum machine that no one really wants yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, like yeah. why didn't you have an 808 i could have retired <laughs> um so yeah i was dabbling with that and i i didn't have a great understanding of music theory at the time and it had always seemed quite cryptic to me yeah so yep. for that reason I avoided doing any music performance or composition type uh, study after school and ended up doing sound production at RMIT in 2000. Cool. Probably within minutes, I just fell in love with the studio. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely one of those things as soon as you walk into a studio with a big desk and things like that, it's like, this is it. (laughs) Yeah, especially when you, if you're a bit of a nerd, you like technology and creativity you know i used to love pulling toys apart and trying to you know resolder things in different configurations and right 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 cool know. um so yeah it was yeah great and i ended up working in a in a rehearsal studio called the sound vault in west melbourne right. it's it's now apartments like many studios yep. and rehearsal <laughs> yep. rooms are um and they had a little recording studio with i think three eight at so it was a 24 track machine yeah and uh well 24 tracks three separate machines synced yeah and so i was working there minding the rehearsal rooms doing the low risk recordings <laughs> yeah yeah and recorded my own band and kind of that i guess that's yeah that's how i got into this that's so cool this. yeah what what a story that's awesome man and tell me about like what sort of music was doing it for you at that stage was like you know, you, you mentioned, you know, the Blues Brothers stuff and the funk and now uh, Jimi Hendrix yeah. and stuff like that. What, what, when in your, you know, teenage years and early yeah. adulthood, what was it for you then? Um, well, probably the, the band that I was most passionate about as a teenager, and I think a lot of guitarists can, will, you know, relate to this, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Awesome. And Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Yeah. And then that Funky Monks doco. Yeah. Anyone that hasn't <laughs> yep. seen it and that's into production, you just go and find it and watch it today. It's so sick. Um, it's so sick. Rick yeah. Rubin and, I think, and, and uh, exactly. just in that massive castle and stuff. It's so sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think anyone that's ever watched it has thought, I need to, I somehow need to buy a mansion in the Hollywood Hills and set up a studio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, we all think yep. we all think that. Yeah. Um, so that's I was into yeah, chili peppers, green day, offspring. Um, beautiful. I didn't really get into Nirvana until later. 
Mm-hmm. I, I tended to avoid trendiness. Like people mm-hmm. started dyeing mm-hmm. their hair and then I would do it two years later. <laughs> yeah. People yeah. started wearing skinny jeans and I'll do it a few years later. So, <laughs> yeah. so I sort of, you know, I, I was more into that funk stuff. And also um, it's a bit weird, but I got into like gangster rap when I was about 12 or 13. Yeah, yeah. Stuff that I would, listening to the lyrics today, I think, you know, it's it's absurd. Um, but it was the rhythms that I loved. Yeah, sure, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love that vocals in hip hop, vocals become a percussive instrument. Mm, yeah. And while there is still a little bit of melody, it's, it's the same as in, you know, melodic percussion. You can have percussive instruments that do have tone and mm-hmm. great drummers tune their kits to the song and they pick their cymbals to the song and they actually they play musically and there is tonal, uh, intentional tonal shifts. It's not just about transients. Yeah, um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I was into hip hop and then... Um, but when I, when I got into sound engineering um, and I was still into that, uh, you know, very teenage boy type music, and I started dating someone that was a program manager at CineFM. Okay, and, cool. And she introduced me to the music that I guess I fell in love, and fell in love with and influenced my own writing. So I'd been mm-hmm. writing sort of, you know, Green Day Chili Pepper stuff. Yep. And she introduced me to artists like Radiohead and Aqualung and Kent and Sigaross, sure, Alex yep. Smith. And that's when I, I guess I discovered that, that mm. indie and that, that was the beginning of the indie yeah. time, you know, yeah. like artists absolutely. like Phantom Planet, like the OC theme yeah, song. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, um, and I'm guessing I'm that jump. kind of fell in, in hand with like the production side of things as well. Cause obviously, I mean, Green Day and, and, uh, and Offspring and stuff. Yeah. The product, production's good. It's all crystal clear and it sounds great, but yeah. there's a difference between that and Radiohead and Sigur Ross that, you know, production elements is like a focus oh, to, yeah. to actually, you know, show a landscape of tones and different things that are yeah. like, you know, attribute to the music. So I'm sure that kind of fell in with that at that time as well. Yeah. No, that's a really good point on the, and I guess, I guess it ties into the evolution of the technology in our industry. Mm. Probably the nineties was really the last era where pretty much every record was about capturing a live performance. Sure. Yeah. Even, yeah, even pop artists, Pop artists had live drum kits. Mm. Sure, there were programmed drums on a lot of stuff, and I'm mm-hmm. not saying that didn't exist. But you listen to pop artists that today would just be all synths and yeah. nothing live. Yeah, yeah. They had acoustic guitars. They had. Yep. You know, um, so when when we shifted from those traditional bands that were, as you said, just capturing performances, mm. to now, yes, we we are capturing emotion, and there we are rapping a soundscape around that Mm -hmm. that doesn't exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it might start in the real world. Bands like, you know, the the eels and they're using suitcases as kick drums and creative stuff like that. But then you've got uh, Sigur Ross where where is that sound coming from? And while you're at it, just invent a new language to sing. (laughs) (laughs) How do you get that sound out of a guitar? Like what pedals are you using? Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. Oh man, I could go on for days about Sigur Ross. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, on, on that note, so I, I had my CDs in boxes for over, probably over a decade. Mm. So I, I got chronic fatigue in my early twenties, which was, pretty horrific um Mm. from a you know physical and mental perspective Mm -hmm. because everything i'd done in my life was to be a singer songwriter sure and i had these chronic sore throats and i was unable to sing and it was it was really depressing and i was Mm. so confused i wasn't going out drinking or you know i was really health pretty healthy Mm. um and then uh, anyway long story medium i ended up moving back home with my folks Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, you know, in a a granny flat out the back of their house and I packed up all my CDs when my now wife and I met and Mm -hmm. they were just Mm -hmm. under the bed. I think I moved them to maybe four different places before we bought this place. And I, I finally unboxed them Mm -hmm. maybe two months ago. Yeah. (laughs) And I forgot, I forgot how great CDs sound. Oh yeah. Yeah. And of course the nostalgia of 
all those, you know, bands that I was just telling you about. Yeah. Just listening back and it's those memories come flooding back and, you know, the CD player is in, it's in a cupboard in the joint, you know, in the, the wall unit. So when I've hit play and the doors closed, I'm listening to several songs, probably the whole record in a row, mm-hmm. uh, all the, you know, the whole song in a row, all of the songs in the record. You think yeah. I could <laughs> know how to speak now, but, um, you know, put it, it's just so different to Spotify where yeah. I, you know, consume most of the, you know, modern music. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. It's like, it's like you are, you know, you're kind of setting yourself up to have an experience with the music. Whereas I know, you know, these days I'm sure most people are listening to music in headphones, which is definitely encapsulating, but you're usually doing other things at the same time, whether you're at the gym or, Mm. you know, you're listening to music in your car and things like that. Like you said, you, you know, you, you would sit down, you would open the case, you would put it in the CD player, you would, you know, look through the booklet and it would be, you'd be in that world of that music. And, and you're right, it doesn't really happen like that much anymore. No. Yeah. I wonder if anyone has done any study on music listening as an experience mm. for generations. Mm. It's, um I just remember, you probably remember too, you know, we we would save up our pocket money mm. to get that record and we'd yep. take it home and we'd close our eyes, put our headphones on, yep. sit in the couch, and we would just listen to it over and over. Yep. And yep. many times I go, I really, I only like three of these songs, <laughs> and I really, but I really, really like them. And then you listen to go, actually, there's some, there's some other things yeah. in here that are really grown yep. on me. And I feel like we're we're deprived of the of the ability to have songs grow on us these mm. days. And my sister's um, uh, 11 years younger than me. And um, they, they grew up when LimeWire was a thing. Yeah. So yep. it's, it's even a, a different kind of yeah. respect for music. That, that was my um, era as well. Yeah. I, I, okay. I grew yeah. up downloading music. I mean, I definitely bought yeah. CDs early, early on and yeah. even into my teenage years, but definitely I was like, I was about 13 or four, 12 or 13 when Napster was huge. So yeah. then yeah, okay. I got the internet at like, you know, 14 or 15 and it was like downloading constantly, just ripping music from the internet. Shitty MP3s that were like intolerable to listen to. Like yeah. right now you'd listen to them, you'd be like, what the fuck? It doesn't even sound like any good. I know. <laughs> Wasn't it a trip though? Like go- going from the standing by the radio waiting for the single to be played <laughs> yeah. to, to suddenly to type just type into the box. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Type type into the search box and it, there'll probably be 20 versions of it and one of them would be half decent. It was pretty yeah. amazing. And the other um, classic thing was like people renaming their own band songs as like the artist. Like I remember like hearing Yellow Card through yeah. them naming it as a completely different band. I think they named it as like Blink-182 or something. And it was, I was really? like, this isn't Blink. Like, yeah. That's, I didn't yeah. know. That's great. Yeah. That's good marketing that's technique. Full, full guerrilla marketing <laughs> right there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Tell oh, me, yeah. let's, let's move into like when you actually started to, you know, find work in, in mm. production and, and, you know, recording and things like that. Did you have any you know, mentors or anyone that was kind of guiding you or did you learn it all yourself? Yeah. Uh, look, it's, it's a good question. I'm from the era, I guess, similar to yourself where, well, I, I mean, I came into the industry in the early 2000s. Mm-hmm. That, in my opinion, certainly in Australia, was the beginning of the end for audio engineer as an employee. Mm. Mm-hmm. back then you could actually get a job in a studio mm. and there were more than just a couple. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, those, those ones in Melbourne, we won't, won't mention them because it's, it's terribly sad, yeah. but you know, one of our biggest studios is closing, you know, in the, in the coming months. Yep. So, and they, they did still employ. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I had to not only teach myself engineering because at university, you don't learn, you don't learn what you need to know to do what we do. Mm. Um, and on that note, I've actually created a solution for that, which <laughs> we could Beautiful. talk about later if, yeah, if, if yeah, you yeah. want to, if you want to go into that. Yeah. Um, so 
so not only did I have to learn on my own of how to do these, you know, to the projects that I do at the scale now, but also how to operate as a small business. And I know you've spoken about this with other producers on the, the podcast, and it's great that you bring it up because I think it's a, it's, it's kind of a responsible thing to make aspiring producers aware of mm. before they start their journey. Yeah. And, and that thing is you will not get a job. You have to create a business and you have to create work. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I think um, it's great that you're bringing that a little bit more front and center because that. this, this is the best time in the world, mm. the best time ever to be a freelancer. Yeah. Yep. There has never been a better time. Yep. Absolutely. 100%. So, so, you know, that's really exciting because when you, as, as you know, when you're working for yourself, like, sure, there are some stressful times, particularly mm. at the beginning, and it's usually all tied back to cash flow. Mm-hmm. But yep. once it's kind of working, it's the best. Yeah. And the, yeah. the challenges that you face are also the, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the most exciting hurdles to challenge because once you actually understand those things that are really troubling, you know, cash flow and, you know, how do I get clients? How do I keep clients? Things like that. Once you actually have a process for them and a system and things like that, it's actually really exciting to dive into that and unpack it and explore it and figure out new ways of doing it and all that sort of thing. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, criti- critical. And as you were speaking about in a, in a previous podcast, even production efficiencies is effectively increasing your hourly rate because most of the time we're working on a, a project-based price, mm. you know, so there, there's always scope and I, I will always, if, if I'm fixing the price, I'm also fixing the scope. Mm. So it's like, yeah, this is the fixed price, but it's half a day to record vocals. If it goes over, I'm getting paid more, Yeah, <laughs> you sure. know, yep. so I'll give you a fixed price, but, um, yeah. So, uh, anyway, yeah. So I had, had to do a lot of learning myself, but where, where I have had, um, mentoring was with orchestral recording. And that was with Robin Gray, who sadly passed away recently. Mm-hmm. And he, he built Alan Eaton Studios with Alan Eaton back in the 70s. Wow. So Robin trained me how to do orchestral recording. And maybe this would be a good point to talk about where I transitioned from a kind of part-time thing into full-time. Yeah, please. Because I think sure. th- this is one of the biggest hurdles for, for most of us. Mm. How do we how do we go from recording our mates' bands for a hundred dollars a day, which is unsustainable? <laughs> how do we go from that to maybe making forty grand a year, fifty grand a year, up to you know hundred k plus? Mm-hmm. And so prior, I, well, there were a couple of pivotal points. One of them was when I met my now wife Michelle. So I was twenty nine when we met. And I was maybe four or five months off turning 30. So I had that end of the decade reflection kind of thing. Yeah. At, yeah. So at the time she was working at Telstra on something ridiculous, like 130 grand. And, you know, I've come from a, from a space where, you know, money is scarce, you know, my, my family working class, you know, mom's side, dad's side, and I've actually had to overcome a psychology, like a psychological thing that was imprinted on me, I believed that I was poor and that people that had money were bad. That like in, in, in it's it, the crux of it. That's, that was my relationship with money. Yeah. Right. And yeah. So Michelle's on $130,000 and I'm maybe making 35, 40 grand a year, living out the back of my parents' place, uh, part-time lecturing at RMIT doing audio production where I get the jobs. And, and I, I don't know, it's, it's weird. And it's, it, it was challenging because on one point, on one hand, I felt emasculated because of how we're, how we're pushed in society. It's like, you know, mm. man's got to be the breadwinner. breadwinner. So that was, 
a really wonderful opportunity to say, where did that belief come from? Mm. <laughs> you know, what's with that? I got to, I got to reprogram that mm. because that is useless. Right. So, so that was challenging to go, okay, I'm comfortable with my, my wife making two to three yeah. times more money than yeah. me, my girlfriend at the time. Um, so, but it did get me thinking, what am I, what am I going to do next? Sure. And, and I, you know, it, most of that time when I was, I was still wanting to be a musician, but the chronic fatigue thing, you know, played, you know, havoc on, on that. Mm. So I was thinking, what am I going to do with my life? Mm. And I'm sure we've all been here. I hated wondering if I could afford to go to the dentist or parking two kilometers away from the venue to save $3 on parking. Now, mm. of course I could have put $3 in the meter, but that was my mindset. Mm. You know, you've got to save every penny. Yeah, sure. Um, yep. So that's, that's where I was in my late, in my late twenties. Mm. And, and I thought, well, look, I'm into business and creative stuff. I have some other side projects like drum sample library that I, and an app that I build and stuff like that. So I like mm. business. Mm. Maybe I could do digital marketing for, for some, for someone. Um, so I started looking on seek and I looked at these jobs like 80 grand, hundred grand. I'm like, this is cool. Of course I got nothing, <laughs> none of them. <laughs> And there was even a job I applied for at, at Music Link, and I I had worked for um, Manny's in the in sure, the yep. early two thousands, yep. and then for Alan's Billy Hyde in the buying yep. office. And my my stepdad was the marketing director for Alan's Billy Hyde at the time, there you go. and there was a product manager position at Music Link that would have been you know the pro audio division, so mm -hmm. it was mm -hmm. probably Reason and the JDK mics and mm -hmm. Steinberg and all of that stuff. Yep. Yep. And I remember putting together a presentation and being really excited about, okay, I could do, you know, this is cool and didn't get the job. <laughs> and I was just, it was just really demotivating. I thought this is just like, what is going on here? Yeah. Um, so my wife's background is in marketing mm -hmm. and, and I would say that she has been incredibly important uh, in the growth of my business mm. because she's really helped me focus on business, focus on marketing. And after all of those sort of rejections and failures to get jobs that I didn't even really want, mm. I decided what would happen if I just stopped doing the artist thing and just focused on production. And then Michelle at the time had a startup, which was for, I think it was called Talent Door, and it was it was going to be an online community for artists and creators of all types, and I can't remember the exact details. I think I remember the name, but, to be honest. It sounds very familiar. It, yeah, well, we did we did um, a presentation part, for part of Music Melbourne Music Week back in yep. the day, uh, so you know the, it might have got around a little bit. Um, and and anyway, she sponsored a competition on Facebook. She so she took over a competition sort of in partnership with, with one of her business partners. And she took this competition. I think the previous year it had had a few hundred, um, a few hundred listen, a few hundred applicants. She grew the following to something like 35,000 wow. and we had over three and a half thousand applicants. And I won't tell you exactly what happened, but it resulted in, <laughs> effectively um getting something shut down by triple j because of this wow. marketing automation tool she'd used we yeah. got we got we got contacted from triple j and, and they you had to do something to, anyway um <laughs> it was pretty fun so i, I, I mean going, I, well, okay yeah. i like that you ruffled the feathers yeah. of triple j but anyway let's yeah let's get yeah, moving yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so so anyway she i was like okay she's good at marketing i sponsored that competition and from that competition Part of part of my, you know, what I got as a sponsor was the emailing list. Mm -hmm. So then I actually put together an email, and I'm terrible with with email marketing. <laughs> I sent two emails to this list, and that generated over a couple of years, probably thirty five or forty or forty grand. Wow! And these were not famous bands. Yep. And like, what if I'd actually kept that newsletter going <laughs> instead mm. of just sending it twice? Mm. So that's when I thought, okay, maybe I can, maybe I can do this for a job. And mm. I rented a space uh, above a shop in Balaclava and set up my mix room, 
projects. It was basically a bedroom studio moved mm. to an office. Mm. But immediately from a positioning point of view, mm. I was perceived as yep. better than home studio producer. Yep. But I was still doing the same jobs. Mm. The next, so that was one, one critical point was that reflection and that focus mm -hmm. and then the support and encouragement from, from my partner and, and actually seeing that if I do a little bit of advertising and marketing, I get phone calls. The biggest shift for me was when I got, I got hired to engineer and mix the music for the remake of Young Talent Time. So, right. Yeah, so up to that point, I had basically been working out of my home studio, which was in my bedroom. It was a Pro Tools HD rig, but it was in my bedroom. Yeah. And I was recording at RMIT, which was essentially a brilliant, a very well-equipped control room attached to a room that sounds exactly like a classroom. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yep. I was yep. like, we can capture the sound of that horrible classroom in glorious detail. <laughs> But I was doing like most of us do, and I was competing on price. Mm. How can we make this cheaper? How mm. can we make this cheaper? Because if I don't make it cheap, you're going to go with someone else. Mm. That's a fallacy. Mm. Yep, that's, a, that's a mindset that has to go. Yep. Um, anyway, but that's, that's what I was doing up to that point. Then, So I went from that and you know, working with mates as session players or friends of the bands as session players, I went from that to and, and sporadic work. Mm to three months full-time in a world-class studio with world-class session players recording hit songs. Unreal. I recorded the MSO there. Yeah. That's where Robin trained me to, you know, we did, we had string overdubs with those players. Wow. And, and that's what, if you'd heard my work the day before and the day after, you would have thought there was a decade experience between us. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. So a couple of things happened from that experience. The first one was, I feel like that's when I became a real engineer. Mm. I went from cobbling together. So I, I had 10 grand in the bank after that. Mm. I'd never seen that much money. Mm -hmm. And mm. then I was able to invest that in growing the business to the next level. Mm. So I felt like an engineer. It's like, wow, I'm, I'm actually doing this. My stuff's getting played on TV. This is, mm -hmm. this is cool. Wow. Um, and then the other aspect, and I think this is really, 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 really important for people to understand, even that have been doing it for years, because I'd been working for 10 years mm. at that time. I'd done a couple of sessions at Sing Sing, but not, they weren't big sessions. Mm. I was using the Neve at RMIT. But at that moment, when I realized that if you've got an excellent room with good equipment, mm. great songs, great arrangements with incredible players, you just put the mics anywhere. <laughs> You hit record and you sit back and you listen to a song. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's things like I'm not noticing the drummer. Yeah. I'm feeling the drums, but I'm not noticing them. Yes. And often when you're working with, with, um, with aspiring artists and they haven't got their chops there yet, mm. listen, go, well, that, the fact that the, the drummer is pushing and pulling unintentionally every kind of bar, mm. that's really distracting me from the song. Yeah. Like I'm noticing yep. them. I don't want to notice it. It's unintentionally pulling focus. Mm. Um, so that's, that's when I'm like, okay, from now on, if people can't afford to, to work with me, with the players that I want in the rooms that I want, well, then I'm going to have to recommend them to someone else. Mm. It's huge. Because and I think it, I like, I mean, you've brought up so many fascinating points, but the, the obvious one is, you know, and I say this in pretty much every episode, but attention to detail is, is everything. And, and what you've brought out is the attention to detail in the terms of who's playing the instruments. And, you know, when you have, like you said, when you have people that have their chops, like it's just second to none because, um, you know, it all just comes together. It's so cohesive. You're not having to coach people on maybe do this drum fill because they, their mm. intuition speaks to the actual song it doesn't like it doesn't require yeah. your attention as a producer to focus on stuff that you shouldn't really need to focus on you just let people do their thing and it all just works and it just comes together in like yeah. you know a package that just feels great to listen to so i love that you brought that up yeah yeah it, it's one of those things that it's a cliche to say it that it's all about the song it's all about the performance but i think 
many people that say that have never actually experienced it mm. because when you experience it, it's like, that's it. Mm. And you know, people talk about editing. What sort of, what, what sort of editing do I do? Very little. Mm. I might actually choose that drum fill into the bridge, mm. Mm. but I'm not having to time align drums. Mm. Maybe there's an otherwise perfect take with a, with a wayward snare <laughs> and like, okay, I'll nudge that. Mm. But that's, that's, Editing drums done, mm. fade in the top, fade at the end, you know. Yeah. That's it. Unreal. Vocals, look, because I, I do develop artists, I am still having to do a lot of vocal editing, which mm. is mainly comping and comping and tuning. Mm -hmm. I've tried. I mean, I, I think if, if you're 50 takes in, then either someone's got a lot of money to pay you for that or something's, something's wrong because mm. even – when I work with voices, you know, I've been lucky enough to work with some of the best voices in the country and many artists that have come off those, mm. those talent shows that, you know, we can, we can have opinions about them. And I think, you know, from my perspective, the main thing about those shows is to recognize that they're not a talent show. They're a drama where artists are cast in roles. Mm. Yeah. So, you know, like them or hate them, it doesn't matter. There's, there's an entertainment mm. medium. Mm -hmm. um, but I can tell you that the indie artists that were making fun like my mates and they were making fun of those shows. When I compared like working with these artists, of you know, Harrison Craig or Anthony Kalee or Casey Donovan, like, wow, like yeah. one take and that's, that's no editing and that's better than anything I've ever heard before. Yeah. I was doing a record with, with Sylvie Palladino and she was on the original Young Talent Time. Mm. I was moved to tears mm. and she's crying. And it's mm. like that, it's like when you – when you go to, to a doctor, you expect that they can diagnose you and do, do their job. Mm. When you go to a build, you expect them to, you know, it's not like, oh, look, I'll, I'll, I'll get the house right next time. Mm. When you get to work with artists with that, that talent, it is like breathtaking. Mm. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to have had the opportunity to be in rooms with these artists. Um, but any, anyway, like mm. back, back to it. If you are developing um, solo artists, it might be one of those things where you, you consider finding those session players that are great. So at least at least that part of it is is um, top shelf. Mm. Hey, thanks so much for listening so far. There is plenty more to come, so don't go anywhere. I just wanted to let you know that this podcast is made completely independently by myself with no sponsors. So if you like what you hear and you would like to show your support, you can send a donation to the PayPal link paypal.me slash what's that sound the link is also in the show notes thanks so much for your support and let's get back to it yeah i guess just summarizing on what we were just talking about i wish someone had told me this earlier and when you're asking me before if you know i had any mentoring mm. etc so most of us are out there trying to figure out how to do it on our own mm. yep. i wish someone had said to me that the room is way more important than you think it is. Mm. The converters are way more important than you think they are. Mm -hmm. The preamp is way more important than you think it is. And the performance, the musicians are way yeah. more, like really stress the point. Yes. And, and it's all well and good for me to say, hey, work with world-class people, it's going to sound good. But what many might not consider is that you can actually do that without having to, so my little, hang on a second. Let me just bring her up here. My little wolf. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you. The, the studio wolf. She's her footsteps on the floorboards making sounds. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Um, it's part of the recording. It's, it's, it's fine. part of the recording. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is old school. Like we we'll leave that we leave all the mistakes <laughs> yeah, in. That's exactly. what makes it that's what makes it good. That's it. Uh, so um yeah, what I was getting at is if you if you start thinking like a business, yeah. like sure, you can't today be working with no one and tomorrow be working with world-class people as, as the uh, service provider. But what you can do is you can invest in your business, invest in your growth and record your own project. Like say mm. I, in, I could spend $5,000 on Facebook marketing and maybe get no leads mm. or I could hire a really good room, hire some really great session players, and even just download some charts and record mm. some covers. Who cares? Like just to have the experience. Wow. Mm. Because what happens after that is 
you now have a relationship with a studio you can use. You now have session plays that you've tried out and tested. Mm -hmm. You and you've learned that this is this is the most challenging thing. Yeah. When you're working and in your own space, um, knowing where your limitations begin and end, and the limitations of the equipment and the space begin and end. Mm, because I I think so many people are out so if they've true. outgrown their space. So yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, Stu, I'm rambling. No, no, I love it. I love it. And but I think um a couple of thoughts that come to mind for me is one is like you may not have access to these world class, you know performers and things like that right but what you do have access to is preparation and your yeah. ability to prepare not in the ways that you might necessarily instantly think of you're like oh I've got to I've got to make sure my guitars are tuned yes I've got to make yeah. sure I've got new strings on them blah 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 right but the other thing yeah. is I've got to make mm. sure that the people that are coming into my studio that are going to be recording with tomorrow with me tomorrow, know exactly what they're in for and exactly what the, I want them to be prepared for. Mm. That meaning if you're not, if you don't know your song back to front, it's not going to come out with a good result. So word them up with that. Make sure that they've, yeah. you know, eaten properly, that they've got food prepared, that they're not going to waste your time, that they know exactly where the studio is. All of those little things means that you're setting yourself up for a much better outcome in the time that you have because you're not worrying about that stuff on the day. These are all little things that mm -hmm. you can do to prepare yourself to make sure that the quality of the recording is better in the ways that you might not necessarily think of. Yeah. E excellent, excellent points. I think that, yeah, I agree. I agree with everything you've said, even to the making sure people have eaten. Mm. You know, when, when, when you think about what do we need for the studio? We need to have enough mics. We need to have enough leads. Well, actually, yeah. you also need enough food. Yeah. And you want it, you want, I think if, I think there's studies done on this as well. A human can go at a hundred percent for maybe six hours and you, then you're gone. Yeah. So. Yeah. If, and you're pushing you're, it. <laughs> Most yeah, people yeah. can only go for like two or three. Yeah, well, exactly. So, <laughs> but the point being is that if you've got everything there, everything prepared, like, yeah. I mean, I like setting up the day before. Yeah. I've got my Pro Tools sessions have got section markers and mm -hmm. rehearsal marks. So um, for those of you who are unaware, rehearsal marks on, on a music chart is, you know, just the letters, A, B, C, D, et cetera. So then mm -hmm. I can just mm -hmm. say in the session, we're going to drop in three bars before letter F. And everyone mm -hmm. knows exactly where we're going from and the Pro Tools operator can see it. And, you know, none of, none of this showing up without a template, without your, your maps, your tempo maps, without charts, um, you know, even, even if you're not, yep. even if the band isn't reading music, I want mm. a chart in front of me mm. because mm. then it means you can, you can make quick decisions. So mm -hmm. I know that they've missed that, that chord in the second verse, mm -hmm. scan the chart. Oh, they, they were playing the same dynamic and the same chord in the first verse or the first half of the second verse. Mm. We can edit that later. Let's just, you know, time's running out, mm. but I know we've got it. And I think um, an, another point with that is like the ability to keep notes as well, you know, how, cause everyone works slightly differently. If not, everyone's going to have the exact same processes, but mm. you do need to be able to have something simple, like an ability to keep notes. And whether that is on an iPad or whether it's easy for you to have the notes app open, or if you prefer to handwrite stuff, th those little things are another thing that just like means that you're not forgetting things. You're not like letting things go, I'll fix it later, this, that. It's like, well, what's going to make it easier for me to edit later is to know exactly which bar I have to edit. And that's exactly. something as simple as writing bar 21 and you'll know exactly yep. what that means for later. The other yep. thing that I was going to say for before mm. is thinking of yourself as a producer in the old school mindset where you are someone that is organising the things, uh, you know, like the people, the right performers, like you were saying earlier, you know, like the film producers or someone like that, you know, you're making sure that the actual process is, is going to be streamlined and you've got the right people mm -hmm. in place to ensure the best quality result will make a difference. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I love it. It's so often, it's so often stated the importance of pre-production and preparation, mm -hmm. but it's, it's interesting to find out how many people actually do it because mm. I've, I've definitely heard people talk about it and then I've got a session from them and there's no markers in there. Like mm, actually mm. do what, do what you say. Like, as you said, yeah. it just, it, 
Yeah. It makes Ab so much, so much difference. Um, yeah. One question I have on, you know, th having these sorts of people that are, you know, top tier professional musicians and things like that, how much of the session, the, the flow of the session comes from their ability to, um, you know, perform well and things like that. And how much comes it comes from you leading them and showing them exactly what needs to be done? Cool. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question and it varies, but it all comes back to what you'd said before, which is about the preparation. So mm. when you, I, when I'm working with session players, I work in the traditional um, way with the more formal way. So I book them for a call. So a, a, typically a recording call would be for three hours for orchestras. It might be two and a half hours for a call, but generally for session players in Melbourne, three hours. So, so I'm going to have them for maybe one call or two calls or one and a half calls. And we're going to smash it out. Like we'll be doing like a song rhythm section done in 20 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so with that in mind, the, the pre-production, again, it depends on the genre. If it's a folky record, I might just be marking up dynamics and, mm -hmm. and rhythms on the chart. If it's something a little bit more indie pop that's got more um, specific things, I might be writing rhythms. I might just, I might put a note, like a, a reference to a song. Mm. You know, I don't, I don't write dots all over a chart. That's sort of beyond my fast ability to do, mm. but I'm definitely think I've got, I'm going in there with some solid ideas mm -hmm. that the artist mm -hmm. and I have, have brainstormed. Yep. Also, I'm choosing session players that are best suited to what we need based on the brief. Mm. So there's that joke about, uh, you know, what does a producer do? What do you think? And that I pick people for their expertise. Mm. So I've got, a, I've got an idea in mind, mm. but I know that if I get, if I get Danny Faruja on drums in the room, I can say, go with your instinct on this one. Yeah. And then I said, you know what? I actually, I don't think that halftime thing was, was working. Let's, you know, well, let's, you know, I might beatbox a groove or something, but I'm hiring expert. I don't want to be better than the drummer I'm hiring mm. at rhythms, but I do need to be aware of things like, uh, it's, as you mentioned about the producer being the overseer of the whole project, I do need to know what the emotional intent of the song is for the artist so that I can differentiate between that's a really great groove mm. and that reinforces what we want the listener to feel. Mm. So it's a little bit of a mix, but I'm definitely going in there with a, a very solid idea. Because if someone's trusting me with the budgets that they trust me with, yeah, it, it's on me to make sure that we, you know, get yeah. that. Um, Absolutely. And I love, I love that the, and it depends on the scope of the project and how much, uh, you know, artistic input they want you to have, I guess, but you know, you know, if, if they do want you to have a lot of artistic input, then it's very, it's great to be able to trust that performer with their abilities and to, to be mm. like, what do you feel like should happen here and see what happens with it. And like you said, you can always, you know, course correct and, and things like yeah. that, but it's, it's one of the uh, best parts about getting a group of people to collaborate on a project because you create something mm. brand new that didn't exist before by allowing them to go, what do you feel like should happen here? <laughs> yeah. Is yeah. that something that you do as well? Yeah, like quite all a bit. the time. Yeah. yeah. All the time. And I love it for, for drummers that obviously, you know, have that ability to draw from places and, and you know, perform really well and not, you know, struggle under the pressure of, you know, recording because a lot of, mm. a lot of people do, you know, and vocalists, obviously, you know, to me, drums and vocals are the core of a song. If with, if when they don't, when they don't fall into place, everything falls apart to me. Um, and so they're oh. the ones that I love to allow to, you know, what do you, you know, try a completely new melody. I'm going to hit record, try it and just see, see what comes out and yeah. just see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if if we lived in a time when you could just write in the studio? <laughs> you know, back just live in the studio for six months and and 
yeah. do that. Like, uh, oh yeah. man, the dream. I love it. Let's um, let's let's get a bit more. Let's get a bit more nerdy and talk specifics about right. you know your gear. Um, I love you know love talking about this. I know a lot of listeners um are fascinated with with, with gear. So let's talk through you know first of all, what software are you using to record? I'm a Pro Tools user. Pro Tools, and yep. what is it about Pro Tools that you know works for you? Yeah, well, maybe I'll, I'll start at the beginning. The first, the first software that I used for audio editing and recording was Cool Edit Pro. Unreal. Yeah, that was in high school, and yep. there was another application. I can't remember what it was. A mate of mine downloaded it from a bulletin board, and it was a step sequencer, but you could load WAV files into it. Wow. And this was an atrocious time for home studio recording. Um, yeah, right. But I remember doing an edit. Um, I cut up samples from Eddie Murphy, Raw and Delirious, and <laughs> and put put these sort of little jokes over the top of some hip hop beats for my RMIT project. So I was yeah. using Cool Edit Pro. Um, then I used Cubase SX. Yeah. I, when I was working at at Manny's, we were able to get staff price, mm-hmm. and yeah. back then it was it was two hundred dollars for the full version of Cubase. So I bought, I bought that and I used Cubase. Yep. And because this is when the, the cheapest Pro Tools system you could get, the 001 had just come out. Mm, it came yep. out the year I was studying. And that was, I think, $2,400 $2, mm-hmm. or $3,200 with the Bomb Factory <laughs> plug-in yes. bundle. Yes, yes. And, you know, I was a student. Like that was, that was well out of reach for me. Yep. Uh, but I eventually bought a, a 002 and then have just been, you know, Pro Tools all the way. Yep. What I love about Pro Tools is that it feels like a tool to me, whereas mm. things like um, Logic feels a bit like a toy. To me. This mm. is just to me. Like yep. I don't, I don't want to see little icons of instruments. Mm. I don't want round. I just want it to look like a console, and I want mm. it to feel like like the the analog way of working. I love that. Pretty much everything is done in two windows. Mm. You know, and I don't have two monitors because ergonomically it's better for me just to toggle between the two and then I'm centered mm-hmm. in the screen. So I just, I love the look of it. I love the layout. Mm-hmm. And of course, um, you know, if, when you're recording orchestras and those, mm. it, look, any sort of session, I don't want to have to think about latency. Mm. You know, it's, it's yeah. yeah, it's, it, yeah. So, so when you're yeah. particularly, I, I run um, Pro Tools native in here now. I did have a, mm. um, an HD6 system for a while, but then I, I switched over to, um, to native so I could go um, 64-bit. And, yep. and I got more power on my old 20, 2013 Mac trash can on HD native than I did with $100,000 worth of DSP on the 32-bit version on the same machine. So, Crazy. Um, but I would never record with an, with an HD native system. Got to be TDM. Like I went to a mm-hmm. project studio um, once and and they were using um pro tools and uad and i said well how do i do my monitoring said, you know you've got to go over here so i'm in this this high stakes recording session where to change a headphone send i've got to go into another application and sc- excuse me another application yeah. and scroll like that for, for me that that workflow in pro tools that's like there are the sends yeah They're right there or, or yep. we're sending out you know no latency you want you want reverb what on the vocal while we sing you want you want a bit of eq on the kick drum while we're recording Done. but not record it <laughs> done yeah so yeah um yeah so yeah anyway i'm a, I'm a pro tools no, I love boy. It. <laughs> no it's it's great to hear because i mean and the other thing about pro tools is obviously it's functionality and anything that you need to be able to do you can do if you know how and but i mean it can take yeah. a lot of learning to actually understand the full functionality of it and whether anyone knows every single thing <laughs> you can do with Pro Tools is beyond me. But regardless, it's it's crazy powerful. And that's one thing that, yeah. you know, I can appreciate pro, about Pro Tools. But um, let's get into hardware. What's some of your favorite pieces of hardware that, you, that you're that using? Um, well, my, fa- my favorite tool, if, if I was Desert Islanded with, with a, a couple of things, it would be this console, which mm-hmm. is the, the D control. And my monitors, the Grover Nodding ones in the wall. Awesome. Um, so that that console is 
just a controller. It does have mm. mon a monitoring path that I don't use. That is just a door controller. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, you know, they were 400 grand at the time. I didn't spend that on it. But this is another thing that I wish someone had said to me sooner. In <laughs> fact, when I bought this, mm. I was using a, the smaller version of it. And I bought this for marketing purposes. Right, right. Because when, when we bought this house, I moved my studio here and we built a proper, it's, it's, it's not particularly big, but it's a room within a room and it's, it's you know, yeah, designed. Yeah. But I thought charging the rates that I charge, if it's at home, I need people to step into the room and go, wow. Yeah. So I wanted a wall to wall console. Um, mm. On this thing, I could have the screen switched off and mix an entire song. Mm. And what I think people miss about the use case for a control surface. Let's let's talk about something really simple, mm. which you could do with with eight faders. If you are trying to balance drums, you will never ever get to the same conclusion with a mouse, mm. because when you can move eight faders at a time, you get this instant biofeedback of context. Mm. Whereas if you're going kick level, kick out level, focus mic, burst mic, room mm. mic. It's just not the same. So that's the first thing is you'll, you'll never get to the same conclusion and you can't, you're going to be thinking you're in the wrong mind space. Mm. But if you're moving faders, you're just feeling, feeling, feeling you're mm. in the right, you're in the right frame you're of mind. Instrument. For, exactly. Mm. Um, so that's one thing with, with this console and Pro Tools um, automation preview, you can do complete scene changes. So every, every plugin parameter, send everything, I can just go into automation preview mode, make the parameters that I want readable ready, mm -hmm. and I can move everything, change an entire chorus, go, yeah, that's, mm. that's, that's pretty much where I want the chorus to be. And then I just roll into the chorus and I punch that automation in. And every parameter gets put mm. to where it was when I was you know, in preview mode. And then I punch out into the verse. Then I punch so it in cool. the next chorus. And it's, it's just, you could, you could never get there any other mm. way. And mm. yeah, so I love, I love that console and I'm incredibly disappointed to, to hear that um, it's no longer going to be uh, supported with the M1 native Pro Tools. So that's, that's, um, that's a bummer, but. Damn. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, nice. Yeah. Hardware wise, I've got the SSL Sigma, which is their 32 channel summing mixer. Um, cool. So that's the same summing engine that's in their um, their like duality consoles. What I love about it is that you can automate it in Pro Tools. Mm. So the way that I've set up my my session, I can do a fade out on the fader of the SSL and record it in Pro Tools. Cool. So I can do my yes. fades. I can Feedback, you know I can bump yeah. up bump up the chorus a dB, um, all of that stuff on the master fader as well as balancing. Um, like I usually do four channels of uh, of the vocals in parallel. I I did mix with the masters with Michael Brower yep. um, over in France. So you know yeah. I, I've adapted a lot of his techniques. So I, yeah, I love yeah. it for that for that reason that I can actually automate and save the automation in Pro Tools. And of course I can automate the SSL console on this console. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else? Um, crazy. What fun bits of gear? I mean, I <laughs> I love my Lexicon PCM ninety six. Yeah. Um, that's a great verb. And also I've got an old Kurzweil KSP eight, which is another reverb. It's cool. I've behind that wall yeah, is an yeah. EMT 140, a like mono noisy as hell plate reverb. Yeah. Um, um, so that's kind of fun. What else? The man loves his reverbs. Lo I love my reverb. <laughs> I've, I've got an AKG spring reverb up there. Um, Sick. yeah. Uh, what else? I mean, the, the classic stuff, like I usually have an Avalon 747 on my back in vocals. Mm -hmm. The stress is in parallel. Manly Numu on guitar, bass. Um, focus right red. I, I often have that on the, on the mix bus. Love it. Although yeah. sometimes it's too punchy. It's like, yeah, oh, it's too punchy. Um, yeah. I mean, for based on the stuff that I've heard, y your your music, it's a, it's a, it's a it's an intense uh, <laughs> sort of yeah. a compressor for the mix bus for for yeah. softer, gentle pop. Uh, well, it certainly, like pop it certainly and wouldn't put it. Folk. Yeah, yeah. It, does, it doesn't go on that stuff, but on the hip hop <laughs> stuff, it, it does. Yeah, Clarophonic. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I I actually I mix through. A TC finalizer. Now, 
I know that sort of feels like the wrong thing to do, <laughs> but I do the conversion on my Orions and then go into it digitally before I come back in. So, cool. um, and it's doing very little. Mm. And sometimes I leave it off, but yeah, I, I mix through a pretty significant chain on my master bus. Like, mm -hmm. what is it? Got a Neve 80, uh, 8803 EQ, which is great because you can save the settings. Beautiful. Um, yeah. So I, I generally, I'll change those settings. So my, my bus settings I'll change uh, as in the master bus, mm -hmm. but all of my, my ABCD bus stuff pretty much just stays the same and I'll swap to different compressors if I, if I want to. That's um, great. But I mean, cool workflow. yeah, it, it's, it's certainly fast, fast to get stuff done, but it's, yeah, it's yeah. weird. Like I, I love gear as you can imagine, but also just becomes a thing that just mm. a sound like, and I'm not mm. thinking about it too much. Yeah. Um, Reliable. What about yeah. software? It's plugins and, uh, and, and things. What, what are your go-tos? Um, my go-tos are as an overall bundle. I think the plugin Alliance mega bundle yep. is, is really great. Yes. If I just, if I had only one, if I had to choose just one bundle, I'd probably choose that for mixing. They're a bit yep. light on reverbs. Um, yeah, but all the channel strips are great. Um, don't, I don't generally use tons of, tons of plugins, but I have, I've been using the, the SSL native strip over the plugin Alliance strip cool. for probably the last several months. Nice. Um, but what are the go-tos? Melodyne, got to yep. get on top of that. Like that's, yep. that's just one of the most useful tools. Mm -hmm. Soothe, I really Soothe's like great. using, um, things like, well, my fab, fab filter EQ, yep. fab filter compressor. I like yep. them. They're really, they're really clean. They I are, use yes. auto align, auto align yep. a lot. Um, drum level is really good too. Uh, Revoice pro. Yep. Um, yeah. A lot so, of, from the sounds of things, you're focused on achieving the outcome by knowing what tools you require to get things places rather than, you know, um, intentionally manipulating the sound to me, it sounds like you're more focused on capturing things properly, which is what everyone should be, but then allowing tools to to get you to that end product. Is that accurate? There's there's, there's part of part of that um, is true. Like I would say, as as I developed experience and and certainly after training with Michael, um, mm. in some ways I do significantly less. But what I do, I might do more aggressively. Mm. So I might only EQ a couple of dB. That's not aggressive. Mm. But if I'm going to saturate, I'll really saturate. Yeah. Or yes. I'll really slam it into the compressors. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, what is it? It's, I think for, from a, you know, what, what's going to actually be helpful for your, for your listeners. So once I got my monitoring sorted, then I just started adjusting the program material mm. when I was working in, in a, a less than good room and with my old Genelec monitors, mm -hmm. probably at least 30% of what I was doing was to the room and the speakers, which is mm. going to cause translation problems. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with, you know, five, six, seven, eight, you know, inserts on a, on a vocal because you're trying to get it to sound good. Whereas now mm. if I look at my, my vocal, so in, in my session, the way I bust things, I'll, I'll have probably verse, chorus, bridge vocals on separate tracks, mm -hmm. probably with the same processing, which will be, um, it might be a, a gentle de uh, fab filter compressor with a soft knee that I just sort of created a gentle leveler, um, mm. gentle leveler patch then they feed into my verse and chorus buses. Right. Now on those verse and chorus buses, I start with saturation, which is typically little radiator or mm -hmm. Antares tube. So I get a sure. little bit of saturation. Then there's a gap. Then I've got my channel strip. So mm -hmm. in my template, I've, I've got 32 channels that is like a virtual mixer and mm -hmm. they come up on the 32 channels over here. So I just keep, if I position the thing there, it's like a 
console and everything on um and like an analog console mm. everything on on those 32 channels on slot three mm. is my channel strip so then when i hit dynamics on the compressor the whole thing just turns into my channel strip so then i'm just eqing and just go from channel to channel without thinking um and just in my high Easy. pass my compressor so so yeah slot three is is that slot four um i think will be something like soothe or um sybil which is another good mm-hmm. ds that i like um i'll sometimes use something like wave c4 mm-hmm. and I, maybe i'll just put this on the chorus channel there's a great preset called pop vocal and it just does something nice to the top end cool so when you get to the chorus the vocals get a little bit brighter and you don't know you don't notice it but you feel it yeah um, then on the Love next that. in the next slot down i think i've got waves vocal rider um and then from yep. there it goes off to four hardware compressors and mm-hmm. and a parallel limiter in the box and then i've got 10 10 sends so a short reverb long reverb slap echo shimmer verb and a spot echo and then five hardware reverbs and so they're just they're just ready to go and the 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 plug-in uh effects on those buses I've got presets that I like, but then below them, I've got other settings that I've made that are deactivated. Mm. So as you were sort of mentioning before, mm. yeah, I, I'm going, I've got all of these presets in my head from the last 20 so or so years of, of working. So I was like, that's the problem, like a recognition of a desire to change the sound. So this recognition mm. of, I want to change the mm. sound. How do I want to do it? What mm. are the steps involved? And is there linearity to it? Yeah, That's kind of the thought process. And then it's, of everything that I have in this room, software, hardware, whatever, what is going to solve that problem the fastest? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they go, you know, that, that reverb is, is too bright. Turn that send down, turn that one up. Great. Yep. Or deactivate this, bring that one on. And, I love that. and what's really important about this is it means that like, think, think about this. You're, let's say you've, everyone's been working on a song where you're just in the zone mm. and it's the, it's the best feeling, the best feeling you're in the zone working on a song and then you have that recognition of a desire to change the sound and then you stop mm. and then you go to your plugin list and that you are, you're just back in that left brain analytic mm. mode and you've just lost it. So that's why I've got deactivated plugins ready to go. I've got more sends than I, than I need often mm. just instant. I'm never, what, I'm never thinking. What I just, love, what I absolutely love is, I mean, what I would now describe you as uh, is an intellectual engineer it your 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 process in your brain is um you know it's it's process based so it's you know if this then this but what the the what it's kind of like if i can like equate it to playing an instrument and knowing whether to play a major chord or a minor chord it's like you use those chords to elicit some sort of emotional response or feeling or you know you're taking a song a certain place but you know, as the mix engineer, you're doing the same thing, but saying, I need this brighter. So therefore I'm sending it to here. That's your version of a major chord. You know, it's, it's, it's kind Mm. of that. I feel like you're using it in that way and you're playing the instrument as a mix engineer, which I, I really, really love. It's, it's so fascinating. So awesome, man. I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm stoked to hear the process that you've taken over the years to get you to this point where everything is fluid and makes sense and you just you you just know and and, you know it's what I feel like I mean I definitely aspire to get to that place and I'm probably already halfway there but you know I love it so so thanks for sharing that oh my pleasure it sounds like you're you're doing all of the right the right stuff I mean it sounds like our process is pretty similar it's Mm. it's just those you know it's Couple different of ways years. of doing things <laughs> I, I would say yeah absolutely yeah. yeah this is this has been so good man um what i like to do before we finish up is you know just ask for those final pieces of advice that you might have for producer engineers and mm. then for artists that might be listening sure um okay i should have I, I, <laughs> did you send me that as a as a as a um i don't a think i did <laughs> i'm sort of on the spot because with my with my uh perfectionist mindsets i have to give the perfect <laughs> answer that's going to suddenly make everybody have viable businesses and be- <laughs> Mate, they've, they've already gotten so much from this conversation um, i know so 
So what what I think is most most helpful. Um, okay, um, for engineers, I think anything that you can do to help improve the the monitoring environment mm -hmm. will be huge. Mm -hmm. So when I was doing Young Talent Time, I had a problem with with my room. And the, the engineer up in Sydney was saying, oh, this stuff's coming in a little bit heavy in the bass end. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up buying IK Multimedia Arc 2 yep. um, at the time. Yep. And immediately my mixes started translating better. Beautiful. It was, it was a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and so what happened for, for me was, and I think most people have this mindset, is we do this mix in the studio, we take it somewhere else, it sounds horrible. And then we, we tell ourselves that we're bad. Mm. We're like, oh, wow, I'm just, I'm not a good mix and my stuff's not working out elsewhere. Mm. But this is the frame I put on that. If you take your mix somewhere else and you listen to it and you think it sounds horrible and you're ashamed, you should actually celebrate that you have the ability to articulate yeah. the difference because that's sure. It sucks that it doesn't translate but celebrate that you can hear the difference because that tells me you're not the problem. Mm, the problem yep. is the room. So get your room sorted out. It will build your confidence. You know, use sonar works on headphones. Mm -hmm. um, you know, get, get some, maybe, maybe DIY some bass traps. Like the, the phone <laughs> bass traps don't really do much, but you can get a, a pack of Fibertex 350 dense insulation and a $30 electric bread knife. Yep. Cut it into squares, cut it into triangles, stack it up in the corner. That's what I've yep. got behind here. Mm -hmm. And yep. that's, that's going to sound great. So get your room sorted out. It will build your confidence. And the next time you feel like your mix isn't working, celebrate that you can hear the difference. That's actually that's awesome. huge. Yeah, um, love it. For artists, um, I guess this is, a, this is a tricky one because, you know, art, there, there's, two, there's two sides to art. One is and I think this is what drives most artists, certainly when I ask people why they're doing it, what their ultimate goal is, they say, I want to connect with people, I want to express, I want to share my story, I want to have a positive impact. No one ever says, I want to draw my entire income from my music. True. Yeah, right. great point. So, so I, think, I think it's important to have a think about what you want in your music career because mm. I often say to to young artists, so high school age and maybe early 20s, that possibly the best thing you can do for your career, given the state of the music industry, is actually get another job that you like, get another skill that you like, that you can then use to fund your mm. music projects. Because you are, you are not going to be attractive to a record label. Like let, Let's say when... When you're my age, you, you need to be making a significant amount of money to pay the mortgage and mm. raise a child and have a lifestyle that you want in your 40s. Mm. Um, so that's, that's going to be really hard at 0 0.003 cents per stream that you're not getting, mm. you know. So I would start with setting expectations around that. A mate of mine is a doctor. He, he's taking 12 months off to make a record. Mm. He's paying Beautiful. for He's got 100 grand worth of gear. Sure, he deferred. He had to defer the creative pursuit and go and study medicine. But, you know, like, I don't feel like I'm 41. Yeah. I still, like, mentally, I feel, I feel like the same way I did when I was 22. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, do, don't... And um, 40s are the new 30 anyway. So. It, it, it is. It is. <laughs> so so that, that kind of um, trope that you can't make it over 25, mm. I, I would say just you yeah. know ignore that yeah. um and possibly yeah possibly find a skill you know mm. learn learn to code you can make you can make 10 grand in 2 weeks <laughs> you know <laughs> True. so yeah. um you know working from home as a freelancer so uh that's that's i guess one bit of advice um for artists is yeah just just recognize the realities that it is a business mm. unfortunately but if you believe in your art and you believe in the product, well, then product isn't a dirty word anymore. Mm. It's actually a beautiful solution to people looking to connect, to people that want to feel less alone because they relate to you. So, mm. you know, recognize 
is a business and how are you going to start that business? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if I wish that you could spend a thousand dollars and make an album and then suddenly make a hundred grand a year as an artist, Mm -hmm. but that's not true. It's like any business, like you, me, we've, we've, we have had to defer, um, other life pleasures like holidays Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. fancy cars and all those Mm -hmm. things to grow our business. And I think it's the same for, for artists is if you, the the biggest advantage you can have as an artist, as a producer is to learn business because you don't, you don't actually have to be great to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's liberating. Yeah. I love it. Well, (laughs) thank you so much, man. I I appreciate your time. Thanks for sharing all of your insights. It's been unreal. Um, Where can people find you? Um, You could just Google Simon Morrow, M-O-R-O. That would, my website would come up. Um, And I guess, I don't know if I'm allowed to plug this, but you can (laughs) cut it out if you want. Um, So I've launched the Academy of Audio, which I ran a, um, a cohort last year and running another one in June, an alternative to uni that I believe is actually better for freelance producers. Beautiful. Effectively, it's just based on everything that I needed to know to grow and establish my, my business. So from the fundamentals, but also through to the business. So it's like you come at the beginning it. of the two weeks and by the end of it, your business is registered with, you know, with Business Vic, your website's live and you've got 12 months mentoring in business and music production. And so... Um, you know, that, that's kind of my, my focus for the next little while is trying to have a, a positive impact on the aspiring, uh, producers, the next, well, the next you. generation. That's, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. I love to hear it. And I'll have all yeah. the links in the show notes for anyone that wants to check us out. We are officially out of time, but thanks again, thanks Simon, chat, and I will Great speak to, to you soon. Thank you. Thank thanks, you mate. so much. Thanks everyone for listening. We will catch you next time on What's That Sound? Thanks for listening to What's That Sound. Make sure you hit follow or subscribe on your podcast platform to stay up to date with each new episode. We'll catch you next time.